Welcome to another conversation with John Mariani, the virtual gourmet. Hey, John, great to see you. A gracious good morning. Uh, in your virtual gourmet newsletter, free, by the way, at johnmariani.com, everybody so got to subscribe to it. It's terrific. Uh, you wrote a nice article, which I loved, about rums, all kinds of rums, ups and downs, and then all. Of the... oh, yeah, I, I have a question for you. Yeah. Spiced rums. We came across a spiced rum recently. Uh, it wasn't bad, but what is, the hell is a spiced rum? I had never heard of that before. Well, spiced rum is the cheapest possible rum that a big distillery has, and they just put in some things that taste like may even be natural cinnamon or nutmeg or something, or it may not, and then they bottle it and they sell it for 10 times what it costs to put in the bottle, <laughs> and people say, hmm, that's tasty. Uh, <laughs> There's only one spice rum that I like, and it's made by Clement, Clement, uh, which is uh, called uh, Shrub, S-H-R-U-B, Shrub Creole. The shrub was, uh, going back to the 18th and 19th century, shrub was something that you would doctor the rum because it tasted good. So you'd be there in the old plantation down in Santo Domingo, <clears throat> or the Dominican Republic, and you'd you know, take some spices and you put it in. You made, basically, it's a punch. Okay. But it was made with uh, made with rum, and uh, so that's shrub. But uh, what uh, Clement uh, does is a really really nice job with very natural products. The way that Cointreau, which is a brandy, uh, puts and uses only the peels of a certain kind of orange that makes it taste radically different from all the other triple sex liqueurs out there. But we were speaking of rum. So actually, uh, I think we we had a conversation about this uh, maybe a couple of years back about why rum was made in the first place. Uh, the value of having it, it didn't it, it stayed well on a ship for long periods of time and uh, and some of the other efficacies of it. But uh, rum is now more just for recreational purposes. So what's what's for us to know about rum when we go to a restaurant? It's, it's got a very long history. Longer than gin, longer than the Scotch, uh, longer than others. Uh, what happened was when Columbus and the Spanish got to uh, the, <clears throat> the New World, they found many things they didn't have in the Old World. Um, but there was no rum being made because the Indians didn't know how to, uh, Native Americans were not knowing uh, how, how to distill or anything like that. And what the uh, the Spanish and more specifically the French and then the British was that, you know, what grows here really well is sugar cane, which was actually imported. <clears throat> and they started to plant sugar cane because of the climate. It's just went like wildfire, grew, grew like wheat. And what are you going to do with all of that? Well, you can use it for sugar, obviously, and sweet things. And that was a tremendous trade. The sugar trade I mean, the, the the French, the British, and the and the Spanish fought wars over sugar. I mean, the sugar wars. Um, what they also find found out is that if you distill the stuff, it turns into what they call rum, and uh, that's a, even better. So this is even better than candy and and uh, hot chocolate and, and and so forth. So rum became an enormous. Uh, well, the sugar cane was an enormous crop, and rum became a great byproduct of it. And it was made in many, many of the islands back then, uh, Dominican Republic, as I say, Puerto Rico, uh, Cuba, and so forth. They all, they all made it. Um, so it became part of what was called a triangular trade, whereby slaves would be shipped to the Caribbean. The slaves would make the rum. They would ship it up to New England. And from there, they, the, uh, the rum will be shipped back. And it was, so it's kind of this, this, this triangular trade, as I say. And without, without slavery, believe me, you could have no rum. Of course, we don't have it today, thank God. Um, but as it went on in the 19th century, it became a very famous. Um, you know, the Dutch had their gins, the Scotch had their scotch, the Italians had their various uh, um, spirits more wine, and the French had brandy and cognac, okay? So, but rum um, became uh, very, very popular with the British Navy and was called, and what grog is, is watered down rum. 
And every it was written into the law, into the ration law, that every British sailor on the Royal Navy would have his uh, grog ration every day or every few days. And that was a little tippler of watered down rum. And that was true up until I think the 1950s. They didn't get rid of that uh, on board. So uh, and Gosling's rum was one of their their favorite. Gosling is a very black, dark, intense rum. So you really got to dilute that. Uh, um, although all rums have come out around 44, 45 percent um alcohol uh, some that go higher or advertise as such but uh and there's basically there's three types there's there's white okay and then there's gold and then there's a, a dark rum really dark rum goslings is an example of that um and everybody who makes rum all of the rum makers uh make usually make those three types um Something like 87% of the rum is made by Bacardi, which is on Puerto Rico. 87%. So you've got to look on the label that says, you know, Dominican rum. Is that, yeah, that, yeah okay, made in Dominican Republic. Um, his, oh, Martinique rum, yeah, that was made in Martinique. Those are infinitesimal amounts uh, because the, there are, while there are many, many rum producers, including Bacardi and Harvard Corp and many, many others. Um, they all make what they think is their best. And what's happening, as I showed in the in the article, is that a lot of new rums are coming on the market. Now, white rum is the most uh, popular because of drinks that can cocktails like the daiquiri, which contain rum. So they're white rums are the most popular. But sipping rums would go into the medium the golden or the the darker quality so to distinguish themselves now as you have with bourbon and as you are now getting with scotch they're doing these what they call iterations iterations of rum in which they take the rum which they buy from bacardi's and they stick it in an old sherry cask barrel or they stick it in an old brandy cask barrel or they stick it in an old rum barrel or they stick it in an old american oak barrel and by doing this, they're getting nuances, which can up the price, sometimes irrationally. You know, it's the same old wine and the same old bottles. No, it's the same old wine and brand new bottles that have come, that were filled up with uh, uh, liquor, rum that came out of uh, these special, uh, these special casks, where they may spend a year or two years or even six months just to pick up these nuances. So uh, proceed at your uh, at your. Uh, your own pace uh, when you get to the liquor store, because some of them can be very, very expensive and aren't necessarily worth it. it rum, rum, most spirits, let's face it, if you're drinking Dewar's scotch or you're drinking a premium scotch or a single mole scotch, that's to your taste. Uh, John, we have a friend of ours, Joe Dernan, whose wife, when we go out to the nicest restaurants and they have 15 different scotches on the menu, she never orders anything but Dewar's. She says, I just don't like the taste of those high priced rums. And there's still a lot of people who get doers or something. So there are a few, a lot of, still a lot of people who love just basic uh, Bacardi, Bacardi White. Now there is um, Havana Club. That's an interesting one because Havana Club was originally made in Havana, and of course when Castro took over, um, it was closed off, except by the United States uh, embargo, so you couldn't bring that rum back into the country, into the United States. Um, alas, it's a good rum. Um, and the and where I have I had I have not been to Cuba, but I have been to Europe and I have been to South America where they still do import it. It's a damn good rum. It's a, it's a they also have well I think white and um, and gold and I like the gold. It makes a great daiquiri. And of course, we've spoken on this show before about the daiquiri. Also came from Cuba, named after daiquiri at the iron mines there when it was uh, concocted by. Uh, the engineers and the, and the coal miners there using limes, sugar, and, um, and uh, rum. So um, uh, if you see on a shelf in America um, a, a, a club, uh, a Havana club, it's not the same stuff. It is a Bacardi product who bought, which is located in, uh, in Puerto Rico and uh, Miami, they bought a recipe. Uh, whatever the recipe is, from a grandson who had the original recipe back in Cuba, God knows when, 
So they say this is this is the real McCoy because we say it's the real McCoy. It's like cigars, which uh, say they're made with uh, you know they're, they're made in the Dominican Republic with, with Cuban wrappings or, or something like that. So beware. But what's in the name? Uh, it's really what you like. It's, it's not quite the same as wine, where <clears throat> there are wines which I would say, how can you drink that swill? But when it comes to rum, you know, if you like this rum, if you love that scotch, if that's your favorite. Cognac or brandy, so be it. Um, there's an awful lot out there, as I detail in the article, which you can go if you go to the virtual gourmet into the archives, you can see this article that Johnny's talking about. Yeah, great, a, a very interesting article too, and great advice. Drink what you like. I love that. Thank you. That's just true. Enjoy your grog <laughs> every day. My daily ration. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.